creativity in me. I wanted to be selfish. It's the attribute, I think, that is the most important attribute that teachers can aspire to acquire. And what I've done is uh, put an acrostic organizer. I like using those in my classes. Some of you know that. And I'm going to use my acrostic organizer as a way of familiarizing yourself with how I've come to be creative and what other people say is creative. And so I'm going to echo that and say as well. There's a before and after. There's me at 24. <laughs> now you have to imagine which of those is me at 24 and which is uh, taken not too long ago. And I, I just wrote reflectively, who are these men who share the same name, separated by 40 years of experience? Does the younger man know what will be in store, or is the meeting just some coincidence? Looking back or looking ahead in the end, does it really matter? You are who you are, and I am who I am, whether you be the younger or the latter. The voice inside my head hasn't changed. The voice sounds the same when I was 24 and when I'm 64. The outward appearances have changed. That was me, my first year teaching in that first photo. And that's me most more recently. I'm introducing you to a mentor of mine, Bob Blue, from Massachusetts. He had to stop teaching because of uh, multiple sclerosis. So what he did is he volunteered in elementary school, and then when those students went to first grade, he went to first grade with them. When they went to second grade, he went to second grade with them. When they went to third grade, he went to third grade with them, and stayed their mentor up until the fifth or sixth grade. He had two stories he told that stayed with me. He came down and actually talked to a group of student teachers here. He was from Northampton, and they invited him to a student teaching seminar. And one of the things he said is that when he was a musical director, they put on Alice in Wonderland. And he asked the students that were there, who wants to be Alice? And eight young girls said they wanted to be Alice. And he said he wasn't going to make a competition of it. He asked them again, who really wants to be Alice? And all eight girls said they wanted to be Alice. So he changed the script. Every time Alice ate something and changed, a new Alice came in. And each person got to be Alice for two shows. So they had a morning show and an afternoon show. So on every other day, there were four different Alices per show. And everybody got to be Alice. <laughs> he also said something that I started using in my supervision of student teachers. He said, when you give feedback to individuals, don't use the word but use the word and. And he gave some examples and I practiced it. I went out and observed a student teacher and I said to her, your lesson plan went very well. The students really liked what you did and you were very effective. And the next time you revise your lesson, please use the format for the lesson plan objective that we've been teaching you. <laughs> it seemed to be received much better that if I would have said, da 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 da, but you didn't use the right lesson plan. So Bob Blue, I only met him twice. I corresponded with him several years before his death. He died on, on uh, St. Patrick's Day, 2006, I believe, if my memory serves me well. My next uh, ingredient is, uh, this is going to be interesting. This is a family reunion hat I got. Uh, I don't want you to tell me where you think this hat came from. But it has, a, it has a place in the history of my family. And uh, I brought this to one of my classes, and I asked students, do they know where this is? And not, nobody knew what it was. So I, I asked my buddy, Jesse Turner, to walk behind me. And, and I'm going to take the hat off and say, Jesse, do you know what this hat is from? Sure, that must be the province of Newfoundland. It is Newfoundland. <laughs> it is Newfoundland. You know he's not from there when he says Newfoundland. Uh, Newfoundland. So, so here's the, the, the province of Newfoundland. Given to me, I have to give props to uh, Maline and Martha, my, my aunts, and, and, uh, and to give me this hat 
and it was sitting on my table, and, and Jesse and John said, we'd like to have you do this presentation, and I said, I, I, I need at least one prop. <laughs> so I got my hat from, from, from Newfoundland because my mom was born there, and I have some heritage there in Newfoundland. So if any of my relatives uh, are watching this uh, later, they'll know that I appreciate their, their, uh, their inheritance in my life. The other person who's influenced me, his name is Burton Blatt. And Burton Blatt was a dean of the College of Education at Syracuse University. But he did something that some of you might have read or came in contact with. He published a book called Christmas in Purgatory. He went in with a hidden camera with a colleague who was a photographer on a tie clip and he divulged the inhumanity happening in institutions for people with intellectual disabilities around the country. And he produced this publication called Christmas in Purgatory. And as a result, Geraldo Rivera did the same thing at Willowbrook on Staten Island. And changes started happening. Well, Burton Blatt uh, wrote many books and he, two of his stories, that I don't think they're all original, but two of his stories have stayed with me. Here's the first one. He tells a story of a, a pianist who just finishes playing this beautiful piece, very complicated and beautiful piece. And as she ends, somebody says, that was fantastic. What does it mean? And she sat down and played it again. And the second story he used to tell is the asking the right question. And he gives this other story that I've heard elsewhere. It wasn't, again, original by Dr. Blatt. But he said, there's a town and things were being stolen from the town. And they posted a, a, a sentry at the, uh, the, the outside of the town to watch what was coming in and out. And so one day, this, uh, you know, this wheelbarrow's full of hay were coming through. And they searched through the hay went on there it happened two or three days and on Friday when they were listing what was stolen the items were 12 wheelbarrows <laughs> so the people looking for what was stolen the hay were looking in the wrong place they're asking the wrong question now Burton Blatt is known for much more than that but those two stories have stayed with me and somehow it influences how I teach it influences how I do things now this other one here, I, I've got I've to do a, a cheat sheet here because I can't read that far from here. Oh, yes, name tags. I guess I could look back here. Right? Name tags. In some of my presentations around the country, I do some work with self-advocates who have intellectual disabilities. And I was in Illinois one year, and I was giving a presentation, and I didn't have a name tag on. And, and somebody from the back of the room a young man with disability said, you don't have a name tag, but you still got a name. And I wrote it down. And I'm not trying to figure out what it means. Because I think it's one of those profound things you just know. It means something. If you try to figure it out, it's like the pianist playing the piece again. You're never going to really get the totality of the wisdom from that voice in the back of the room who said to me, so I started collecting name tags. They made a collage of name tags for no other purpose than to associate it with this story. <laughs> you know, the story of the name tags. So this other one here is uh, reflection. Much as when I gave you the photo from then and now, every 10 years I wrote down my values that I held dear and I commented on them. So I have a, a, a manuscript that does the, the 80s, the 90s, 2000, 2010 about the values I held in my life and how I've modified my points of view on those values. It's very cathartic. It's very self-reflective. So when I look at my students and my classes, I started developing this double acrostic organizer called a reflection. And I started writing about what I thought of them as students in my classes in this poem-like you know, structure because I wanted the reflection to be a reflection. And I thought that was pretty creative. I, I thought it was a good, so I, every time I teach my class, at the end of the class, I give them the same one. Because everything on there pertains to them as new students, just as they did to the previous students that were in another semester that I had. So reflection, every reflection. I'm proud of that one, you know. <laughs> I'm proud of that one. Now, we mentioned earlier in the evening about uh, failure. J.K. Rowling, gave a commencement address at Harvard University not that long ago about the benefits of failure. 
And also, Stephen Jobs, I think, gave a commencement address at Stanford University about being fired from Macintosh and forming Pixar. And both of those individuals, of course, became quite famous, said that they wouldn't have been at their level of achievement if they hadn't had failure. So how do we allow students in the classroom to fail and it to be honored, the failure to be honored? Uh, professional development, I think I'm going to skip through that one. I'm going to go to the Red Sox because I believe that I t uh, every single game of the Red Sox season this year, I did one of these. I summarized the game using the word Red Sox or uh, Francona came to town. The old manager of the Red Sox playing for Cleveland came to town, so I used Francona as my acrostic organizer, but I summarized what the game was like. And then here's one, the Little League World Series happened this day, and Japan beat the United States. Well, on that same day, the Red Sox played, so I summarized the Red Sox that way. Uh, so I think to myself, what if I had a student who really loved the Red Sox? How could I build math? How could I build geography? How could I build any of the more academic content areas around that person's love of, of, the, of the Red Sox? Poetry, uh, I'm gonna do one of the poems, I, I believe that this one uh, resonates with me. It's called, uh, What is the Length of Time? A State-of-the-Art Practice Remains So. My profession has a set of practices that seem to come and go. A state-of-the-art car seems to last about two years. I've only owned a used one when state-of-the-art soon disappeared. I wonder how long this quality can last as a new model emerges to replace the past. I bought a state-of-the-art laptop at a computer store. I couldn't possibly want any better one or ask for anything more. It had memory and speed and plenty of storage space. I thought it was just perfect as I left this selling place. But I read a great big flyer later that very same year. It said a state-of-the-art version would soon be coming here. Uh, uh, this works the same in education. I'm sad to have to say, state-of-the-art curricula appear much the same way. A product emerges with high professional acclaim. The best of its kind is often included within its name. But this product, too, lasts just about two years when a different publisher's creation suddenly appears. State-of-the-art loses its spark when you pay your first bill. It's already over the hill. It was just a marketing ploy to buy that educational toy. This one I'm not going to go through. I'm going to... Uh, go to my final inspiration for my creativity is, is Bob Dylan. Uh, there's no success like failure, and failure is no success at all. It's a very common phrase attributed to him. But uh, I had the occasion when, when Jesse was, uh, Dr. Turner was walking to Washington, D.C., to remember a Bob Dylan song called A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. And, and I like to have an opportunity to share parts of it with you. And it's called The High Stakes Test Are Gonna Fall. And so I'm not going to sing it, thankfully, Aww. but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say it in a way that perhaps does justice to, uh, to, to, to Bob Dylan. Oh, where have you been, my walking man? Oh, where have you been out walking the land? I've walked in my home state, yes, from the northeast, 10 miles at a town, time in the rain and the heat. I've been in the country and I've been in many a town. My steps take me up and they also bring me down. I've stepped on the sidewalk and I've stepped in the street. I've walked alone and with many people I meet. Each day is a new dawn with the friends that I make. There's a spirit with me every step that I take, and I'll walk. Yes, I'll walk. Yes, I'll walk for us all, for the high stakes tests are going to fall. Oh, what did you hear, my walking man? What did you hear out walking the land? I heard teachers and students and parents all pleading, get rid of these tests, our hearts are a-bleeding. I heard shouts of anguish and long drawn out sighing. I heard a heart-wrenching screams amid all the crying. I heard laughter from the people who make all their money off the backs of the students who don't think it's that funny. I heard critics who say we can all do better. I heard from hundreds of parents who sent me their letters. And I'll walk, yes I'll walk, yes I'll walk for us all, for the high stakes tests are gonna fall. Oh, what will you do now, my walking man? Oh, what will you do now, out walking the land? I'll talk to the people who know things are not right. I'll share all the stories and help them shed some light. I'll, walk, I'll work with our teachers for better ways to assess. I'll help make real plans, get us out of this mess. I'll dedicate my life to the students I meet in the literacy center when they come once a week. I'll never back down from the high test stake lies from the people who deceive and pull the wool over our eyes. And I'll walk. Yes, I'll walk. Yes, I'll walk for us all for the high stakes tests are gonna fall. So I thank Jesse Turner for doing that you know I got one more one more to share with you and uh, of course we got to get uh, some personal ones up here 
when, when my grandson was born, I went to Bob Dylan again, and I said, well, what will Bob Dylan inspire me to write? And so I took the, the, the uh, names of his songs, and I made it into my own cross-stick organizer where my grandson's name's on the left, and his mom and dad's name was on the right, and every, you know, uh, every uh, line it starts with a Bob Dylan. Uh, I won't uh, say it to you now, but I'll be more than happy to share copies with you at some point with my daughter's consent. So I think with that cross stick organizer, if I were to have a time to reflect in which I'm happy that uh, John and Jesse gave me this opportunity, it would be these are the people and things that affect what I do now. And I think that it echoes some of what our speakers this evening mentioned about uh, the child that needs creativity, the child that needs to learn how to fail, the child that needs support environment to pick themselves back up. The words we're hearing now like grit. We're learning other words that pertain to what it takes to be a successful student for jobs that, again, haven't been created yet. So I, I appreciate this chance to share this with you. Thanks. <laughs>